In Charles Simon's theory, which I advocate a lot and which has been uh, somehow the driving force behind my work in the last many, many years, and that is using the inclusion of the boundary of a manifold into a manifold to get some ideas and discover some things about Charles Simon's theory. So let me tell you on one slide what Charles Simon's theory is about. So basically, Charles Simon's theory has a piece of defining data, namely a Lie group, which, well, people are trying to work now with non-compact Lie groups, but that's really complicated, and I can say I don't understand that situation. So I will just stay in the case of compact Lie groups, and here's its Lie algebra as well. And then, uh, well, there's a story about G connections, which for simplicity you can think they are in uh, the trivial uh, principal bundle in, uh, uh, I mean, on a, a three-dimensional manifold M that I mentioned there. And so you can think of them as being just, uh, you know, matrix valued uh, one forms if you want to have the simplest description. And then uh, to such a functional, you associate a number which is the uh, so-called Chern-Simons functional and uh, which is evaluated by integrating uh, uh, a three-form that is, uh, if you want, uh, uh, Lie algebra value three-form on your manifold. And then, well, you take the trace, actually, of the matrix value one form, and then you integrate that, and you get a number and then with this number, you define an oscillatory um, integral, and you use the chern simons functional as the um, um, action for a physical system, and you write the principle of minimal action in a quantum setting, so you construct what is called a Feynman integral. So in short, what the Feynman integral does, and I have some uh, object with me to illustrate uh, the Feynman integral that's of interest to us is that you have a particle that moves through space in a certain field and as it moves it changes a certain internal information and that information that changes is given in terms of the rotation of a certain internal vector of that particle and then you uh, take the expected value of this rotation over all possible fields. And this is the Feynman integral of chern simons th theory that Witten proposed. And basically the main question in chern simons theory is to integrate this, uh, uh, is to, sorry, to understand this integral. So this is what I've been doing most of my mathematical life, trying to make sense of this integral. And so I want to tell you that one uh, point of view, uh, it's not the only point of view, but one point of view is to forget about the particle itself, so to hide the particle and remember just the trajectory and then try to identify trajectories that give the same expected value. Now, uh, the computation of this integral, you know, it's a, this is a rich field, you know, you have an integral that somehow, oh, here is yeah, a drawing. So one or several particles, by the way. So you have one or several particles traveling on closed paths in a three-dimensional manifold, and then you compute some expected value. So this integral could be interpreted analytically as an integral operator, and then you can use the so-called property of convolution. And this is something that I won't address in this talk because you have probably all seen, I mean, the younger generation has probably been exposed to it tremendously through Atiyah's uh, axioms for a TQFT, which had an impact throughout mathematics. So it's, it was something that has been generalized to the extremes. I will actually try to not to generalize, but rather to particularize. So I'm trying to look at a particular situation rather than open up, you know, this idea of the axioms of a TQFT. So 
first of all, I want to point out that there are two ways in which you can treat this as an integral operator. So there are two ways in which you can cut your manifold into pieces and compute these path integrals on pieces. So you can cut through the curves, through the trajectories, or you can cut in a way as to avoid trajectories. Now, I want to stress out that uh, there's something that I feel is not well understood. When cutting through trajectories, people are a bit too optimistic. So one has to be a little bit more pessimistic when cutting through trajectories. Namely, there are many people who believe that more is true when, in fact, not everything that is believed is true. So I'm really careful when cutting through trajectories. In my uh, work, I mostly use the cutting through trajectories just so that I decide what local relations I impose. But then outside of that, I will prefer to keep these uh, trajectories intact. So I want to work with closed curves, in other words. Now, the idea that uh, has been around for maybe like 20 something years is to select some combinatorial properties of these Feynman integrals, which could be either local, which happen, as I said before, when you cut through the curves, or global, when you avoid cutting through the curves. And then you arrive at a concept, you know, through this identification of, uh, of uh, trajectories that give the same value for the expected value for the Feynman integral. You arrive at the concept of scheme module, which can be seen as a purely combinatorial uh, you know, uh, theory in uh, low dimensional topology, although I strongly advocate against forgetting the Feynman integral structure and the richness of Chern Simons theory. But nevertheless, I want to point out you know, to these objects, the so called scheme modules, the name comes from knitting because they are some constructs that uh, involve knots and links and some combinatorial operations on knots and links. But uh, these objects, and I will show you in a moment how they look like, are uh, deceivingly simple, but they are truly unifying objects in mathematics. So they definitely connect low dimensional topology, algebraic uh, geometry, representation theory, and quantum theory. And they can connect them into quite subtle ways. So here is how the construction proceeds. Basically, you introduce some variable, which let's go a few slides back. Makes sense. If you look at the uh, Feynman integral that we were discussing, it contains one object that I did not explain. So I told you that we look at what happens when you travel along curves, and everybody here should know that that's that I was mentioning the holonomy of the connection. To get a number out of it, you take the trace of the holonomy. I mentioned the L of A, which was some integral of the connection on the manifold. But there is one piece of information that I didn't mention that is called the coupling constant. But in most of my models, I treat it as the Planck's constant. So you introduce a variable T, which is e to i pi times this coupling constant H. And then you construct some, and then you consider some ring of functions in T. And t when you fix H, then R will just be a ring of scalars, like complex numbers. And then you consider a free R module, or in the case where R is C, a free vector space, whose basis is the set of isotopy classes of knots and links, or maybe graphs in an oriented three manifold. You arrive at graphs when you allow particles to collide which happens, for example, when you flatten the picture to the two dimensions, and that's the idea of the Russian school of mathematics. Treat, treat 3D as 2D, move this to the so-called vertex models, and then do uh, mechanical statistics. And then in that situation, when particles collide, you have to introduce graphs as well. And then that would yield some other scheme modules. So basically, you consider something that is quite popular in topology. You consider, you know, some algebraic structure that is based on geometric objects. You do algebraic, geomet uh, algebraic topology based on knots and links. And then you make it small, exactly like in homology theory. You factor it by some relations that arise from properties of Feynman integrals in chern simons theory. So let me show you a few examples. So the simplest example, well, 
here is like a, a small uh, uh, summary of this. And I want to, sh uh, to point out that this idea uh, arose, I mean, originally I think the first roots of it can be traced to some work of Turaev in the, uh, Vladimir Turaev in the 80s, but the combinatorial framework, the way I phrased it here, was really proposed by uh, Josef Chetitsky uh, about 30 years ago. And uh, um, it, uh, it comes with this, you know, um, uh, so Turaev had the idea in two dimensions and somehow Chetitsky put the three-dimensionality in the, in the picture. So here are the examples. So um, the first one and the second one seem to be connected and I will explain you what the difference is. So the first one, you take the Lie group to be U1, the ring of Laurent polynomials in T and T inverse, and then you took, take oriented frames, lock knots, and links. So frame meaning that they are uh, uh, knotted ribbons in some three-dimensional manifold. And then you, you know this, uh, you consider the uh, module over C T T of inverse, T T inverse, whose base basis is the set of all such uh, uh, knots and links. I, actually, I should say isotopy classes of such knots and links. Uh, the fact that you can work with isotopy classes is just because the Feynman integral is a topological object, and so it doesn't change under deformations. And then you allow the identification of two such knots and links if in some embedded ball, they look like in the first picture, so you either have a crossing or you put a T and you don't. So um, as you have a module, right, you can multiply curves by, um, by numbers, and this is reminiscent of the property of the Feynman integrals themselves. They are numbers, so you can multiply them with numbers, you can add them, and so in the same way you should be able to add knots and you should be able to multiply knots by some scalars. And so if two of them coincide modulo the first relation or the second relation, then you just identify them. I mean, if two of them are the same outside of an embedded ball, and in the embedded ball uh, you have a crossing or you have a smoothing, but then you have to add a factor of t, then you identify the two curves. We call them skins. And also, whenever you see a trivial link component, you just erase it. So it turns out that when you allow these operations, because there are so many ways in which you can embed balls as to create crossings, that the enormous amount of knots and links in a manifold collapses, and you get just very few. And they have been computed by Chetitsky, these objects. They are known to be computable in terms of the homology of the manifold. In fact, one views them as deformations of the homology, although that's not entirely correct. They are slightly more complicated than just the homology. Uh, the second example is... Uh, so. The first example was actually studied by Chetitsky, and the second one is just a variation of myself. And uh, by the way, with uh, my collaborator Alejandro Uribe, who some of you might know, he's at University of Michigan and he's a mathematical physicist there. So here I set up the variable to be e to i pi over some even integer. So I make the coupling constant, remember t was i pi h, I make the coupling constant the reciprocal of an integer. And then I add one relation which says that whenever I have n parallel curves, I can erase them. Now, the fact is that both of these models are legitimate for the so-called U1 Chern-Simons theory. The second one has uh, more uh, relations added to it than the first. Uh, so the question is, you know, why do we have two different things for the same theory? So it is our freedom to decide how much of the combinatorics of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, wills of the uh, uh, path integrals we want to incorporate. And if we incorporate the... Uh, uh, all, I mean, the relations that I gave you in the second example, it turns out that you recover the entire structure that Witten predicts. So the scheme modules, for example, two, give you the entire theory that Witten predicted 
nothing less, nothing more. But you are free to forget, for example, that last relation in the corner, and then you get less. Okay. The third example is that of the Jones polynomial, and uh, here uh, the group is SU2, and again we have two models, so there is a li little bit of a war in this uh, area, but uh, uh, the group is SU2, the same ring of um, uh, Laurent polynomials in the exponential of uh, the coupling constant or the Planck's constant, how I like to view it, and then the knots are no longer oriented, and uh, whenever you can see a crossing in some embedded ball, in the first example, if it comes from different uh, uh, link components, you resolve it by the first relation, and you get a sum of two links. And if it's from the same component, you do it with a second relation, where that epsilon stands for the sign of the crossing, which in this case is well defined. So these relations arose from understanding the uh, quantum group of uh, SL2C, uh, and they were derived by uh, Paul Melvin uh, in the uh, early 90s. And they were shown to be associated to the so-called Jones polynomial of knots, which is obtained in the reshetigin turaev um, normalization if you take a knot and you apply these relations and you apply them until there are no more crossings and no more uh, uh, trivial uh, link invariants in the three-dimensional sphere, and then what you get is a polynomial, and that turns out to be the Jones polynomial. Uh, there is this sister version of it, of the Kaufmann bracket, where all crossings are resolved the same way, with one small change, namely that the um, trivial link components are replaced by negative t squared minus t to negative 2. Uh, so, you know that two models somehow come from two different sides of the planet. The first model comes from the Russian school of math mathematics, and the other one comes from basically from the Western structure, uh, from the Western, uh, uh, um, you know, um, school. And uh, they were both addressing the same issue, that of uh, uh, finding uh, good uh, mathematical descriptions of simple models in statistical dynamics that started with things like uh, ferromagnetism. And uh, there were two proposed solutions. One was by the Russians with quantum groups, and then uh, uh, in the West there was this model of uh, uh, temporally Lieb algebra, and they gave us different scheme modules. And finally, I want to show you uh, an example, and by the way, I want, to show, uh, I want to stress out that in the third example here, the relations are local, but the fact that you have to keep track of whether you have two components or one component, this brings also some global information. So not everything is local. Same in the previous slide. You see, up, you only have local information. Down, you have some global information in this object. So some information about how the curve looks overall in the manifold, and then some relations are about what, what just happens locally. Finally, in the case of the Jones polynomial, it turns out that to get the full uh, information of uh, the Chern-Simons theory that Witten predicted, again, you have to restrict yourself to a root of unity. You have to make the coupling constant a reciprocal of an even integer. And then you have to add one more relation, which I won't explain here. It's like taking several parallel copies, but it's more like taking a polynomial in the curve. And this polynomial is dictated by representation theory. So that's all that I want to say about this fifth example, is that uh, adding a global relation, you get uh, uh, the full force of uh, Chern-Simons theory. Now, I also want to point out that very deep computations in representation theory show that this relation can be done locally, while there is a theorem of one of my colleagues, uh, Alistair Hamilton, that this relation for U1 that I introduced that was a global relation cannot be done locally. So here you have to really think about things that can be seen only in the big image of the manifold and not in a local uh, ball. And here is the sixth example, you know, for the group SU3, 
there are some skin relations for graphs. So this time the skins are actually th uh, trivalent graphs, and these graphs become more complicated for SUN. For SU3, at least, they, there are a sequence of works by uh, uh, Greg Cooperberg, by Otsuki and Yamada, and then by Charles Froman, who basically construct uh, these objects, the schemes for the group SU3. They give you the combinatorics that they should satisfy. Now, there is a little bit more to it if you want to get exactly what uh, uh, Chern Simon's theory wants. So if you want, this is an intermediate step where you have enough information, but it is also simple enough so that you can do computations by uh, pencil and paper without uh, too much effort. Okay, so what is this good for? Let me get uh, closer to the point of view that I wanted to talk about. So there are two particular situations of skein modules. Um, one where the uh, manifold itself is a cylinder over a surface, in which case you can put two skeins one on top of the other, basically. You can glue one cylinder to itself, and that defines a multiplication on uh, the skein module, so it turns it into an algebra. And the simplest way you can think about it is that you have a surface and you draw curves on top of it, and then you uh, draw one curve, you draw another curve on top of the old curve, and then you resolve the crossings using skin relations like the ones that I mentioned a moment ago. And, oh, what, what happened? Why can't I, oh, shoot. Yeah, because they want to scan, that's the problem with windows. And then if you have a manifold with boundary, then the skin algebra of the boundary acts on the skin module of the manifold and induces a module structure over that algebra. So here is schematically how things happen. So if you have a, a surface, then you can put skins one on top of the other. So you can put these linear combinations of curves one on top of the other and resolve crossings. If you have a manifold with boundary, you can push skeins, you can push curves from the boundary into the manifold, and you get a module structure. So this is something that I have been working with. We are, in fact, not too far from the model that uh, led to Atiyah's uh, axioms. In fact, these curves turn out to be, if you add sufficiently many conditions for them, they turn out to be the vectors of that uh, uh, mod model of uh, TQFT. But I want to uh, concentrate just on these two situations, on cylinders and on manifolds with boundary, and how uh, the manifolds with boundary have this uh, algebra structure. So there are these two situations that I really care about that I've been playing with for many years. One where you have a genus G handle body and the surface that bounds it. And one where you have a knot complement and its boundary is a torus, which are illustrated over here. So in red is whatever is in the skin algebra of the boundary and in blue is whatever is inside. So you have, you know, the action of the boundary on the interior. And there is one situation, in fact, this has captured most of my time uh, uh, always, you know, was the case of the solid torus, which you can think in both settings. So the trivial knot or the genus one handle body. And many people dismiss it as the trivial case of Chern Simon's theory, but I find it quite difficult myself. So I don't know, maybe I should learn more and then it will look trivial to me as well. So here is an example for you one, what kind of story we extracted from uh, this uh, point of view of uh, uh, a manifold with boundaries. So if we have a genus G handle body and we have the action of the skin algebra on the uh, solid uh, handle body that lies inside. Uh, I will illustrate, you know, the idea without looking in the beginning at the handle body, just looking at the algebra itself. But looking at the handle body is where the true richness of the theory comes in, in place. So I consider this uh, uh, 
particular situation, you know, of uh, the example two, where I already imposed that uh, the coupling constant is a uh, number which is a root of unity. And I, we should also keep in mind that we have that relation about n parallel copies becoming zero. And then I just wrote the multiplication rule that is given by the scale relations of U1 uh, for those two curves. So you see that when you resolve, there's just one crossing, and when you resolve it, it's like cutting and then joining the arrow so that there's no crossing and so that there is uh, um, um, yeah, no crossing, and we have to multiply by a t in front. The t is e to i pi h. And well, this one not only looks like, but in fact is related to something that we have seen, I think yesterday maybe, or no, this morning? When was Ernesto's talk? Yesterday, yes. So the canonical commutation relation for the momentum and the position operators for uh, uh, the standard model in quantum mechanics. So the relation that I wrote there is, very, is not just similar. In fact, I have explained in detail that it comes from this canonical commutation relation in exponential form. So when you... Um, take the uh, standard uh, you know, canonical commutation relation, which is uh, the mathematical version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and you exponentiate it, and the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula gives that formula in red. So, um, in fact, I should say that this process of exponentiating position and momentum is somehow standard. Anyone who has studied an introduction to quantum mechanics knows that this is related to Weil quantization, namely to how you quantize observables in uh, maybe the oldest or the simplest way. You decompose them into elementary oscillations and then you take each exponential and you quantize it by the rules uh, that you exponentiate the position and momentum. So you replace uh, e to 2 pi i x by e to 2 pi i q and e to, e to 2 pi i y by e to 2 pi i p and then you sum using the inverse Fourier transform. So what we basically discovered was that the action of the skin algebra of a surface on the skin module of the handle body itself is given by vial quantization. So not only that we have these rules for the algebra, but these rules actually have an analytical version when you make things act on the skin module of the handle body itself. And you have a very natural way of identifying certain skins in the handle body with vectors in the vector space of the uh, vial quantization in order to make the two modules identify each other. So uh, I should uh, point out that vial quantization is done in the most old-fashioned way with Hilbert spaces and operators acting on Hilbert spaces. I am very old-fashioned when I talk about quantum mechanics, very uh, non-commutative geometric way, you know, the way it was done in the 50s. Uh, and the point uh, here is that by examining these scan modules, we realize that, in fact, this action uh, of the scan algebra of the boundary on the scan module of the interior is the same as the action of the discrete Heisenberg group on uh, theta function with char characteristic that uh, uh, Andre Weil has discovered in the 60s. And in fact, the relationship between scheme modules and theta functions isn't that artificial as it might look. In fact, this comes from, uh, if you want, the relationship between an elliptic curve and its associated Jacobian variety. So on the elliptic curve, you have closed curves on which you compute uh, complete uh, uh, elliptic integrals. So you have the elliptic integrals on one side. On the other side, you have the exponential functions because the Jacobian variety is an, uh, a torus. And well, the correspondence between them is in fact, uh, or uh, deforms uh, in a nice way to this relationship between scale modules and theta functions. So uh, on the Jacobian variety, if you want, there is a quantum model developed by, uh, by uh, Yuri Manin, I think. He's the one who pointed out that the theta functions and the entire theory of theta functions just has, is a consequence of very simple quantum mechanics. And then there is this correspondence between the elliptic curve and the Jacobian, which basically leads to this connection between combinatorial geometry and um, 
and uh, um, uh, combinatorial topology and analysis. So let me talk about the case of the Jones polynomial, which is somehow similar. So here, uh, the work started with uh, an observation of Charles Froman, which then I picked up and went deeper with it. And then I ran into Alejandro Uribe and I showed him what I was doing. He was doing some other stuff that had absolutely no relationship with what we were doing. And then we looked at each other's papers and we had exactly the same numbers in the papers. And then we realized that we are actually doing the same thing. So we had these complicated formulas that were identical. So for the group SU2, there is this way of resolving the crossing of those two uh, red curves on the left. Basically, you have a sum of two terms. And yes, indeed, this is also related to the canonical commutation relation in exponential form. I deleted the 2 pi i's, so I wrote just e to the p when in fact should be e to 2 pi i p. And in this case, it's about the exponential of the position plus the exponential of the negative of the position and the exponential of the momentum plus the exponential of the negative of the momentum. And this, well, there's a reason why this is so. It's because, um, as I'll say in a moment, the action of the skin algebra of the torus on the skin module of the solid torus is again given by Weyl quantization. And in this case, it's about the moduli space of flat SU2 connections on the torus. So the fact that we are dealing with quantizations of moduli spaces of connections was already understood by Witten. What we have understood additionally was that chern simons theory gives the Weyl quantization in this setting. And at this moment, I'm working with Charlie. So basically everything looks right. We just have to write down all the details that the same thing happens when you look at the group SU3. Again, the uh, skin algebra of the torus uh, acts on the skin module of the solid torus in the same way as Val quantization gives uh, uh, the action of its operators on uh, the Hilbert space of the quantization that you get from geometric quantization, but the operators are computed using Weyl quantization. So you have this, uh, if you want, correspondence between a purely combinatorial model and an analytical model. I should point out that uh, the search for anal the analytical model in general, in Chern Simons theory, is a difficult question. It uh, is a question that excited Sir Michael Atia. So I have made just very little progress in the case of Tori. It's extremely difficult to address this question. So there are uh, combinatorial questions. So here the theory of skin modules basically hides some representation theory that was uh, uh, proposed as a quantization model for uh, these uh, moduli spaces in the 80s by people like Alexei Shomerus, Foku Rosli. And so basically the question here is how do you go from the combinatorial model to the analytical model. And uh, well, working with these scheme modules and thinking, you know, and, and just drawing diagrams and re resolving crossings helps a lot and led us to these discoveries. Uh, I should uh, now go to the case of a knot complement. So the torus that bounds a knot and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, that bounds a knot complement and its relation to the knot complement itself. But for that, I have to say a few things here additionally so that you understand what the situation is, what, what, what is happening here. So in the case of the group SU2, that relation by, uh, uh, that was introduced by Kaufman in the mid-80s uh, that came from um, doing... Um, you know, um, dynamical mechanics in two dimensions and then became something by which we compute knot invariance and later we define scheme modules. If you take this relation and you force t to be equal negative one, it's like making Planck's constant zero. But you see, it's a slightly twisted version. That's why I prefer the version of the Jones polynomial. There really, the Planck's constant zero makes t equal one. So e to i pi h is e to i pi times zero. But nevertheless, this is a very simple toy model. So if you set t equal to negative one, then based on, observa on an uh, observation of Charles Froman, uh, Bullock on the one hand, and with some contribution by uh, Adam Shikora and Joseph Chitsky, what they have shown is that what you get for the scheme module 
is something that has now a ring structure regardless of whether you're on the surface or not. And this is almost like the ring of regular functions on the character variety of SL2C representation. So you look at the variety of SL2C representation, you look at their traces, these still form a variety, and then you look at, well, polynomials on that. And there's a nice way to connect this to that. In fact, it's not so hard. I mean, if you're familiar with the works of uh, the people who are doing hyperbolic geometry in the 80s, then it somehow shouts at you. So uh, Froman was a postdoc in his early age uh, at UC Santa Barbara, where things were happening a lot in uh, hyperbolic geometry. And it was for him, when he saw the Kalman bracket, it was immediately obvious, wait a second, this is about characters of representations. And so that was how they got to this. And I should say the same is probably true for the case of the Jones polynomial. Uh, I haven't checked yet, but I, I checked it for the case for the examples that I need. So the fact is that the two examples are so close to each other that it won't be any glory to reprove the theorem in the other case. So I'm postponing it until I have time. But I prefer the other example because the other example is really uh, closely tied to uh, Chern Simon's theory uh, as compared to the previous one, which the Kaufman bracket is mm, almost. So. Um, Here's the picture, basically. You have the uh, uh, manifold, which is the knot complement, and you look at how the boundary embeds in the knot complement. And I try to draw, you know, the torus on the boundary, just a chunk of it, because otherwise it's impossible to read. So you see, uh, the, the idea that I look at are curves in uh, the knot complement and curves on the boundary of the knot complement, and then I push those curves inside. Now you see, this idea of connecting the boundary of a knot with a knot was actually very fertile. I should say not just that. In fact, uh, some very profound results in, uh, uh, in the geometric topology come from this idea of a manifold and its boundary. If you think how the Casson invariant is defined is basically starting with uh, handle bodies and their boundary, and then you do the Higgard decomposition and you look how you know two character varieties intersect on, on the character variety of the boundary. There's the A polynomial, which was introduced by Kuller, uh, Cooper, uh, Long, Shale, and Angile, and which builds on the same idea how the boundary and the manifold relate to each other. So this was very fertile for knot theory, and it turns out to actually have uh, the same richness of ideas in Chern Simon's theory itself. So basically, um, if you think about what I just said in a moment, that uh, the scheme module is almost the ring of regular functions, uh, almost meaning that, well, there might be zero divisors, but ignoring that, uh, it's the ring of regular functions, you realize immediately that this module structure of the uh, uh, skin module of the knot complement over the algebra of the boundary is related on how the, uh, the uh, variety of SL2C uh, uh, characters of uh, the fundamental group of uh, the knot complement sits inside the character variety of the torus. Uh, the character variety of the torus is pretty much like two-dimensional, and then you have a one-dimensional complex curve inside a two-dimensional uh, variety. So uh, this was, uh, in fact, the idea that lied behind the definition of uh, the so-called um, uh, apolynomial of a knot, which is a powerful tool, you know, for, uh, for uh, people who do hy uh, uh, hyperbolic uh, stuff for knots. So why is this interesting for, um, uh, for geometric topologies? Basically because the SL2C representations contain among, of the fundamental group contain among them the one that gives the covering uh, of the knot complement by the hyperbolic space if the knot is hyperbolic. So the character variety basically carries all the information about uh, hyperbolic knots. So if you control the, hyper, uh, the character variety, then you can uh, control, you know, the geometry of the knot. And in this case, because the, that module structure uh, uh, is about this, basically, it's, I, I can't even use the word deformation. Some people use incorrectly the word quantization, but there's a way of passing from the classical situation of character varieties 
to scale modules for arbitrary t, and this situation was exploited by uh, uh, Charles Froman, myself, and uh, another student of Froman, Lofaro, many, many years ago, you know, when I was uh, quite young. So this was basically exploited in order to give one of the major examples on how the Chern-Simons theory relates to Thurston's theory. In fact, there aren't so many examples, but they are uh, extremely uh, surprising and uh, e extremely deep. So this is one of them, and it has given uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a lot of, uh, of stuff out of it. So I understand that, for example, uh, Witten right now is quite interested in this situation and um, this is one reason why uh, scale modules have become rather popular these days, although they have been around for like 20-something years. So I want to show you some examples, just so that you can get an idea how uh, these examples are computed. Uh, I should tell you that um, chern simons theory has the downside of being an, a theory without many examples, without many experiments. It's not because examples don't exist. It's because they, they are incredibly hard to compute. So people like to take refugee into abstract nonsense just because uh, sitting down and computing an example can be painful. So let me show you two examples here. Uh, so one of them is the case of the figure eight knot. I also have the case of the trefoil, but those are less interesting. You know, the figure eight is really interesting. It's hyperbolic. It has nice arithmetic. So we know uh, spectacular things about it. And I should say that here in the background, there should be a lot of arithmetic. In fact, uh, I have a postdoc who is a number theorist, not a topologist, precisely for this reason, because I have to learn uh, a lot of number theory to, to understand these things well. So let me just show you the case um, of, um, oh shoot, I put the wrong picture here. Oh, eh, now I'm punished. I'll, I'll show you with my hand what, y, what X and Z is. So, yeah, well, I can't draw it. I, I can draw it because by morning somebody can wash it. No, I have to draw it here. So Z runs here, exactly like Y, it hooks up two strands, and X is just the guy that goes once around this. So the scheme module of the knot complement was proved in uh, late 90s to be free by Bullock and Lofaro to be free with this basis. X to the N means N parallel copies of X. When I write X to the N Y, I have N parallel copies of X and a Y somewhere else. And the same thing with Z. In fact, one observation that I make, I, so I worked with a guy, Jeremy Sane, many years ago, and then I came back to this knot with a student of mine whom I have right now, uh, Anne Almeida. It's better to work with a basis uh, where instead of x to the n, you use Sn of x, where Sn are the Chebyshev uh, polynomials of second type, well, in a certain normalization. Uh, this is quite surprising. You see, they pop up naturally. These objects have been used both in the construction of the reshetikin turaev invariants, uh, I mean, not both, in the construction of reshetikin turaev invariants, but in th that construction is somewhat ad hoc. Somebody comes and says, this formula works, and then you check it. Well, they somehow seem to arise naturally in all computations. Like, if you start drawing diagrams and computing and computing with schemes with links in the knot complement and you resolve crossings and you compare and so on, then somehow you start seeing these polynomials just popping up naturally. I don't have a reason why they pop up naturally, but they seem to be very naturally present there. I can tell you a philosophical reason because we are really looking at something that has to do with character varieties and these are characters of irreducible representations. But why they are so natural, there, I cannot say. So this is one of the questions. So, uh, and then by slightly modifying the basis, I discover, I mean, we discovered, it was a, a work of many, or of three people actually in, uh, in a few steps, for example, that uh, if you take the curve one zero, which is the red curve there, if you take the Y, if you push the red inside the knot complement, 
you resolve crossings, you move things around, and then you try to write it in terms of the basis. That's what you get in terms of the basis. Now, the formula is rather simple. If you think, I mean, it shouldn't be that simple. Uh, there are, for the red curve itself, it crosses itself four times and then it crosses the blue curve four more times. So if you naively just resolve crossings, then you will have 2 to the 8th, 256 terms. But somehow they cancel out, and you get a nice formula. And this seems to be a trend, like somehow things look nicer than they should, but not as nice as you would expect. So let me show you something so I use the word rompecabezas. If you like rompecabezas, this is what you should be doing. It's so hard to do computations here because there, I see no algorithm. So you just play with curves, and each time it's a puzzle. You draw a two-dimensional diagram. You have to think in, think in three dimensions, and then you have to perform certain moves of that diagram to turn it into some other diagram and it really cracks your head. It's, it's enormously difficult. That's why I need more people. I can't just do computations myself. So I should point out that uh, two of my students are learning from my uh, colleague and collaborator, Dmitry Pavlov, how to, how to automatize this. So Pavlov is actually an algebraic topologist, a quite abstract algebraic topologist, but equally good computer programmer. He, so he's a winner of the IOI of the International Olympiad in Informatics. And uh, he worked for Google in his past, you know, before. Uh, his, and, uh, so he, we're trying to crack this and do it uh, automatically. It's not easy. It's, uh, I have no algorithm. I, I'm just playing with curves until they work. So with another student of mine, for example, we went to the three-twist knot, which is the next step from the figure-eight knot, the next simplest hyperbolic knot. Again. There's a simple basis for this, which can be given in, those, in terms of those curves x and y. And then here are some computations. So what happens when you make those curves, 1, negative 3, or 1, negative 2, act on the y, uh, uh, on, I, so, I'm sorry, on s0 of y, s1 of y, s2 of y, and s3 of y. So here are two formulas. And if you think this is simple, here's more. And here's more. And more. Done by hand. So I should tell you also that, again, if you naively try to uh, just resolve crossings using the scale relations, then for the 1, negative 3, times S3 of Y, you'd get uh, somewhere between 100,000 and 1 million diagrams. So uh, you can't do it that way. So you have to find tricks of doing it. Uh, now, the real reason why I care about these is, again, because of that nice relationship between, the, uh, uh, with, between Chern Simons theory and um, uh, Witten's uh, uh, geometry of three-dimensional manifold. So this seems to be one of the um, doors that opens towards that relationship. But there's a lot of stuff that we don't understand. So we've been just experimenting with examples and trying to get beyond a few guesses, you know, and some conjectures like the AJ conjecture or the volume conjecture. Okay. And with this, I have to say that I am done. Thank you for listening. ¿Por qué la geometría hiperbólica está asociada con...? Con estudiar la variable de caracteres. Ah, sí, sí, sí. Pues, um, sí, so, uh, for those who didn't understand, so his question was why the uh, uh, character variety is associated to hyperbolic geometry. So, again, the thing is that you're looking at basically all morphisms from the fundamental group of the manifold into SL2C. And you're just looking at traces of these, because, I mean, if they are equivalent module or some conjugation, you 
can identify them. You don't lose any information about them. Now, among these representations, there is one which comes from covering it, from covering the manifold by uh, the hyperbolic space, right? So, uh, if you look at vector transformations, they give a representation of the fundamental group into well, uh, uh, in, into the group of uh, isomorphisms of um, H3, which is BSL2C. And then, therefore, you get a representation into SL2C, if you want. And so, having all of them together contains already the, uh, that one. So, if you have all morphisms from the fundamental group into SL2C, in particular, you have the one that gives you the deck transformations, and therefore, all the information should be there. And so then people have various ways of extracting that information. And the so-called apolynomial for knots is one good tool for extracting such information. 